Hi and welcome to the River Santon YouTube channel. We're so glad that you decided to join us for today's message. Now, Pastor Andre and Vilma Olivier are the senior pastors of the Rivers Church, and we have campuses in Santon, Durban North, Belito, Centurion, and Kailami. They've been in the ministry for over 40 years, and in this time, they've been asked so many questions. Now, in today's message, Pastor Andre will be answering one of those big, important questions that many, many people have been asking him. The message is very rich in content, so we've decided to split it into two parts so that you don't miss out a thing. Well, as we get into part one today, we hope you're ready to take some notes as we enjoy God's Word together. I want to speak to you this morning on how to know God's will for your life. How to know God's will for your life, a very important topic, and it's probably one of the most asked questions of pastors by church people. How do I know when God is in something? How do I know His will for my life? And it can seem somewhat confusing, but I want to tell you today, God's will for your life is very simple, and the principles are very clear in Scripture. I think a lot of us feel like Peter in Matthew chapter 14 where Jesus is walking on the water, and those famous words of Peter are to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. We want to know in the dark times, in the challenging times, in the financial times, when we're about to get married, when we're about to buy a car, Lord, if it's you, give me a sign. And we want to know God's will, and it can be extremely frustrating. Some people are even afraid of God's will. They say, don't tell me about God's will because I know what God's will is like. He'll tell me to sell a business, put me, make me a missionary in China. <laughs> or you'll, marry, you'll tell me to marry an ugly woman and, and I'm not up to that. I'm looking for a beauty. And we think God's will is sometimes suffering and it sometimes could be. But we're afraid of it rather than embrace it. But God's will is not confusing. Many people say this, God told me to. Yet the outcome of their life is very clear that God didn't tell them to. And often it's their emotions, their sensitivities, their inclinations, rather than God's will. And I think a lot of the time we interpret Scripture incorrectly. So I want to warn you up front, I might disappoint you today, but I do believe for the majority of people, there'll be clarity today and there won't be confusion. So let's look at it under three main sections. And uh, the first thing is this, God doesn't hide His will from us. God's will is not some, God's not hiding around the corner. And as soon as you get around the corner, then he's run around the other corner. And, he, and if, he, if I chase after him and I run around that corner, and if I fast and if I, and if I read my Bible every single day, and then suddenly he'll give me a word. No, if God wants to make his will known to you, he will tell you. God is not hiding from us. In fact, when God deals with serious matters, that's when he will tell you clearly, whether you want to hear him or not, he'll speak to you. Remember the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus? The wonderful conversion of Paul? God got a hold of him because God wanted to make his will known to him whether Paul wanted it or not. And here when God speaks to Abraham, I want you to notice what he says. It says, then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. When God wants to do something big, he will let you know and you won't have to try and figure it out. It'll become very clear. In fact, the late George Truett, an amazing pastor, pastored in his church for 50 years in Dallas and is a very widely respected man. He said, to know the will of God is the greatest knowledge. To do the will of God is the greatest achievement. God will make it known, and if we obey, it's one of the greatest things we can do in our lives. Now, Paul prayed for the church in Colossae, the Colossians as we know them, and he prayed for the will of God in their lives. He wasn't praying that they'd be able to hear God's voice and know which pair of shoes to buy. Should I buy the white handbag or the black one? Should I buy high heels or medium heels, Lord? Should... The silly stuff we pray about. I think, I think all of heaven must break out in laughter. <laughs> we pray about things that we shouldn't pray about. When Paul's praying for the Colossians, he's praying for something much bigger. I want you to notice Colossians 1.9. He says, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Now, here's the reason. So that, so that what? You may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. Jesus himself says this. He says, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. 
when you really want to serve God and know his will and you study the scriptures and you obey God, then you discover that Jesus is the son of God. But if you don't really want to do God's will and I want to do this and you know, I want to come to church now and again, but I want to sleep with my girlfriend or I want to do this and, and every now and again I, want to, I have to bribe in my line of work. No, no, you need to serve God's will, which is his, his great desire and his character and nature. Remember the Lord's Prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's not about guidance. That's, the, that's the, the, uh, what God wants us to do. Uh, yeah. E.C. Baird put it like this in trying to simplify this and the fact that God doesn't hide from us. He says, you ask, what is the will of God? Well, here's the answer true. The nearest thing that should be done that he can do through you. Don't stand in a queue uh, at the supermarket and someone in front of you is wearing old clothes, their shoes are worn out, and they're buying a loaf of bread and you can see they're counting the coins. And here you come with your steaks and your lint chocolate and bottles of luxury wine and, 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 and Lord, should I pay for his bread or not? Don't be an idiot. Of course it's the will of God. <laughs> Look at what you have in relate. Just do it. I don't know if it was the Lord. It was the Lord. Because God's intention is for us to do good. That's the number one thing. So we're going to look here. Number two, there are three kinds of will of God. We'll look at them in A, B, C, and this will help you. And then I'm going to come later to nine ways that you can establish guidance in your life. Are you with me? So at least you know where I'm going. So firstly, when we talk about the will of God in the Bible, we get what's called the moral will of God. It's not directional, it's moral. What does God want us to be and do? It's not where does he want us to go, how does he want us to behave? It's the general nature and character of God. So for instance, you read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I think it's around verse 3, it says God wants us to be holy and he doesn't want us to live like the heathen who, who, who uh, don't know God and, 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 they, and they live in lust. Uh, the marriage bed must be kept undefiled for this is the will of God concerning you. It's God's general desire, can you see? And sexual behavior is part of God's will. A lot of people want to feel good in church and have friends in church and the vibe in church and the coffee shop in church and occasionally the, the, the special events in church, but they don't want the will of God. Now, the will of God is what God's overall wants. Are you with me? It's like parents. You want your children to behave a certain way. It's not, it's not good enough that they're in the house. They need to abide by the rules of the house. You with me? So there's a moral will of God. In 1 Thessalonians, it says this as well in chapter 5. It says, give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God. This is what God wants. Then we read in Romans, and here it talks about the general moral will of God again. So for marriage, for sex, for money, for church membership, for serving, for reaching the lost, etc. He says here in Romans 12, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, as you're different, you think different, you behave different. Then, he says, if you do that, you will be able to test and approve. In other words, know what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. You wanna know what God's will is? It's when you live surrendered to what he wants and how he wants you to live. You can't say I believe in Jesus and then live like you like. No, no, that doesn't work. It's the moral will of God. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 4, and I did say there'd be a lot of scripture here. Uh, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, Peter says, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. We are different because we do what God wants, not what we want. Are you with me? And so to try and make us and the world marry is crazy. The only place the world and us look similar is maybe the design of the building, the lighting, the stage, maybe some of the clothing we wear. You know, there's similarities because we live in the world. But when it comes to values, we do what the Father says. The moral will of God. Paul, in speaking to the elders at Ephesus, talks about this. He says in Acts 20, Therefore I declare to you today, he's about to leave them, and he says, 
that I'm innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. In other words, I didn't just preach trendy topics and gimmicks and use illustrations, and then occasionally we had drama, and you were kept entertained. Now, I told you everything of God's mind. He loves you, but you also need to be holy. God is good, but he'll also deal with you if you don't listen to him. And so the whole counsel of God is the moral will of God, which has been pushed aside in favor of feelings and fellowship. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 6, as slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Then he explains to us, work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Can I encourage you when you go to work? If you want to know what the will of God is for you, give it your all. So tired of going to businesses and waiting while they have a chat. Uh, don't mind me, as soon as you're done. Talking about the weekend party and what so-and-so said to so-and-so and how so-and-so said, and I told her and she told me. When you've got a moment, would you be able to bring me a cool drink or even in restaurants? No, what's the will of God? Christians, you, when you go to a restaurant, you know, that has to be a Christian. You go to business, that has to be a Christian. Why? Because they're doing the will of God. See, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17, it says there, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So in other words, when we don't do what God's moral will is, we're actually being foolish. Then he explains, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. In other words, don't let your life be carried away by what everyone else does. If you go to a party, then just get caught up. Ah, here with your martini, I'm just connecting. You shouldn't feel comfortable there because you should be concerned about what the Father wants. The moral will of God. Am I making sense? This is not about telling us what to do, where to go. It's telling us how to live. But number two, we get what's called the directional will of God. This is where God guides us and gives us specifics. But even there, we need to be discerning and not gullible. This is not personal guidance, but sometimes it can include personal guidance. You'll remember in Acts 21, there's a man called Agabus. He was a prophet. And he came up to the apostle Paul and he tied his belt around his hands. And he said to the apostle Paul, this is what the Holy Spirit says is going to happen to the man who goes up to Jerusalem. They're going to bind him. And Paul undoes it and says, so be it. I'm ready to give my life. Or, in other words, I can hear God's guidance, but I'm not going to govern my life by it. Be careful when you go to meetings and people tell you this, that, and the other about you. Then it needs to come from what God is saying to you first before someone else brings out a guidance to you. Otherwise, you put people on a pedestal. They hear from God and I don't. No, no, even Paul was discerning when the prophet spoke. And here's the thing about God's directional guidance. It's not always clear. He'll give you a hint. And then if you obey, he'll give you a bit more. Abraham, go to a country of which I will show you. God didn't tell him where. And as he went, God blessed him. Isn't that true? And it unfolded in his life. The Bible says he set out. In the book of Acts, we read uh, about Philip. And it says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Like, go to the end too. So he started out. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch. See, he obeyed God because God was directing him, but not everything was told. And as he stepped out, he met the guy who was reading Isaiah. Uh, Philip asked him, do you know what you're reading? He said, no. Philip explained to him. Then he said, well, what stops me from getting baptized? And Philip baptized him on the side of the road. And so guidance unfolds. Remember when Jesus told the 10 lepers? Remember the 10 lepers came to him to be healed? He said, go show yourself to the priests. As they went, they were healed. You see? It, it, directional guidance often comes when you first obey a little bit, then it unfolds. Same with Jesus and the 12 and the feeding of the 5,000. He gave them the five loaves and the two fish, and he said, distribute it amongst the people. And as they broke it, it multiplied. He didn't put it on the ground and say, stand back, boys, this is big. <laughs> oh, bread over everyone. No, as they obeyed his guidance, it happened. A lot of the time we don't hear God's guidance because we don't obey the little things. Number one, we don't obey the moral law, but we want guidance. Can't work like that. You first obey the moral law and the written word, then you get directional 
guidance. In fact, Greg Laurie wrote a book, Pastor Greg Laurie from the States, wrote a book called uh, How to Find the Will of God. And he says, start with obeying what God's Word clearly teaches and what is clearly taught in God's Word. Why should, shouldn't he tell you more when you won't even pay attention to what he has already told you? See, God's going to speak to you. And here's the problem. We often misquote texts in the Bible about guidance. And we expect guidance in petty matters, but there's not a lot of personal guidance mentioned in the New Testament. To the apostles and prophets there is, but not a lot of personal guidance. And let me ask you this question this morning. If so many people are hearing from God, how come no one prophesied the pandemic at the end of 2019? A lot of people follow all these people on the internet. Oh, that prophet, this prophet, that one, this one. Well, how come they didn't know about the pandemic? They're all hearing God, apparently. The Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord told, the Lord told, but never said a word about the pandemic. Something so big he overlooked? Come on now. You see, this is the problem. You get verses like this. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. People say, you see, I heard the voice of God. No, it doesn't mean that in John 10. It means that sheep follow the true shepherd to salvation, not the false shepherds who destroy their lives. It's talking about salvation, not about personal guidance as to whether you should buy white shoes or black shoes or whether you should buy a BM or a Haval. I can tell you which one. Am I making sense this morning? See, the directional will of God is extremely important and we can take... Texts out of context, a lot of verses, and I don't have time to read them. In the book of Isaiah, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. When you study the text, it's talking about behavior, not personal guidance, where every little decision you're going to make. Here's the thing. When your children are small, you tell them every little thing to do. Come here, sit down. No, not those shoes. Put the other shoes on. No, no, wear these shoes. Quiet, put those shoes on. So that your parents guide you. You know their moral will but they also direct you. It's a funny story. When my kids were small, you know, they get potty trained and then they go to the toilet. And what they usually go to the toilet, they can't wipe themselves. So they usually go, then they shout from the toilet because we'd all be talking. They shout, I'm finished. And someone would wake up and then we go. Some parents can relate. And you wipe their bottom, wash your hands, pull up your pants. No, pull up your underpants first. Yeah, the whole thing and you happily guide them in it. But when they are 18 or 20, and they shout, I'm finished, you're like, what? <laughs> Some of us want God to wipe our bottoms, literally, when he's saying you need to be mature and look after yourself in the practical areas of life. See, the reason I say this is not to de-spiritualize everything, is some of you are confused. You're waiting for voices. You're looking for signs. You're running from meeting to meeting to this person, that person on the internet, and you don't know what God wants for your life when it's actually very simple. Think of this. The book of Acts spans 30 years, but there are only 20 occurrences of personal guidance in 30 years, and some people are wanting it every day. Should I buy this car? Should I buy white bread or brown bread? No, don't be silly. Don't be immature. You need to know that directional will of God is quite rare, and it usually involves big matters. Number three, or point C, sovereign will of God. Is this making sense to you? The sovereign will of God. This is what God will do when he wants to, how he wants to, and we have to accept it. So let me ask you this. If we read the moral will of God and we read the general will of God in the Bible, how many of you agree God wants to heal? How many of you agree God wants to bless you? And get that straight. The Bible talks about God blessing Abraham and blessing and a promise of blessing and increase and you'll be the head and not the tail. God cares about your welfare. Uh, if you multiply your talents, enter into your master's happiness. So there's a lot of promises. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 1, it says, uh, no matter how many promises God's made, they all find their yes in Christ. So that's the will of God. However, uh, and one of them also is that you might live a long life, that you might see length of days. Are you always me? How many of you know Jesus experienced none of that? He lived to 30 years old. He suffered. He was persecuted. He didn't receive multiple of blessing, and he ended up dying on a cross. But was it the sovereign will of God? Absolutely. See, a lot of people think Jesus was caught. They caught him. I would have pity. Eh? He could have lived to 40, but they caught him there in that garden. They should have showed him a side door that he could have ducked. No, no, no. 
It was God's sovereign will to offer his son for our sins. See, in Luke chapter 22 and verse 42, Jesus prayed in the garden, not my will, but your will be done. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, we read this. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. The plan and purpose, the sovereign will of God. Acts chapter 4. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. But then it says this. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. God is sovereign and will do what he wants to do. And he will tell us if he wants to, and sometimes he won't. So God's moral will, God's directive will, or directional will, then God's sovereign will are the three kinds of will. Paul was called by the sovereign will of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1, and there's also Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of, of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Paul was called by God after 400 years of silence. Uh, God suddenly reaches out. Jesus comes. Paul is called by God. He didn't have a choice in it. It was the sovereign will of God. Do you know that if you're going to be a missionary to China, there's not much you can do about it. God will put his hand on you in such a way that you can't avoid it and will reveal himself to you in such a way that you know it's him. We don't have to be like, should I? Shouldn't I? It's pretty clear. I hope, I hope this is helping you in some way.